welcome uh, everyone to our grand rounds uh, this morning. We're all excited to see each other virtually. Uh, again, want to acknowledge our speakers, Dr. Ariana Levin and uh, Teresa Long, who uh, on their own really have uh, an interest in uh, COVID-19 and personal protective equipment and have uh, produced a rather um, prepared a grand rounds for us today. Uh, so if you would look at the chat section as well, the chat section is where you'll be able to post any questions. I'll be uh, monitoring questions uh, throughout the, the presentation. I will jump in if there is a question that I feel like needs to be asked at that moment. Would ask that everyone uh, keeps their microphones muted. Uh, if we do get feedback, then um, our our AV team will end up muting you on their own. And then finally, if you would all look in the chat section for announcements about CME, the CME phone number, the CME code. Uh, do want to just let everyone know that uh, there's a lot of ha things happening in the education realm uh, for any faculty on if you are interested. Uh, there are some uh, rounds that we're doing with residents, both resident-driven, both faculty-driven. There are opportunities to produce mock world board-style questions, uh, et cetera, as we uh, work through this time. Uh, again, want to thank our presenters today. And Dr. Ariana Levin uh, comes to us by way of Cornell. Uh, she's one of our PGY2 residents. And Teresa Long is our PGY3 resident coming to us by way of University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, turn the time over to you two. Thank you, Dr. Petty. I also wanna let everyone know if you can watch on a computer, it may be better. We have a lot of pictures for you today. So as Dr. Petty introduced, I'm Ariana Levin. I'm a PGY2. I'm with uh, Teresa Long, our PGY3, and we're excited today to present to you COVID-19 masks review of the science, sustainable innovations, and practical use. Today, we're going to cover surgical masks, N95s, cloth masks, and most excitingly, innovative designs, including new ideas for fabrics and 3D prints. And for each of these, we're going to review the current CDC guidelines, recent scientific literature, our university guidelines, as well as practical use and considerations at Moran Eye Center. There are many challenges to the healthcare system right now. We are fortunate to be in an ambulatory center that's sheltered from many of these. But one of the challenges is shortages in personal protective equipment. There's even a web page from the CDC that allows healthcare centers to calculate how quickly they're going to burn through their PPE. Do we specifically have a mask shortage yet? Well, New York Times has reported on how the world's richest country ran out of a 75 cent mask. Bloomberg News has reported on hospital workers making masks from office supplies amid US shortage. NPR has reported COVID-19 has caused a shortage of face masks. Moran Eye Center is using a lot of masks and about a month ago, I wondered if we had any alternatives. I was thinking that if we were able to use fewer masks, then maybe our stock could be used elsewhere. I wondered if it would be financially beneficial at a time when our clinic volume is low, and I imagined that at the very least, we might produce less waste. Here at Moran, we're currently using masks in the following settings. In clinic, we have physicians, technicians, patients, and schedulers all in masks. In the operating room, as usual, we have our physicians, anesthesia, and nurses in masks. All of our administrative faculty and staff are now wearing masks as well. Here's what PPE in New York looks like right now. These are Instagram posts from my friend, Dr. Jamie Law, who's currently a resident in New York City. In the first panel, uh, she writes, organic chem goggles from college for the win. In the second panel, we see a very blurry syringe and she writes what my vision actually looked like all night. And in the third panel, she says, also those were pressers and a syringe in my pocket, cowboy night medicine, question mark. If we had reusable masks, then the solution to we're running out of masks would be an easy solution. It might also reduce the number of disposable masks that we have to purchase and the number that we throw away. So the first question I asked was, do reusable masks exist? 
I asked two of our international fellows, Dr. Sophia Fang and Dr. Avni Shah, if they had ever seen them. Shown here are our texts and their answers. So I had written to them, have you seen any hospital anywhere use reusable masks, like our green gowns with masks? And Sophia wrote, no, just reusing. Avni wrote, many would use the same surgical mask all day, but then throw it away. I haven't seen reusable ones. I telephoned Moran Eye Center's green gown supplier to ask if they had ever sold them. Uh, they told me, no, we haven't seen reusable masks. We're not in the business of masks because gowns are medical devices and masks are not. But they also made an interesting comment. They said that an increasing number of hospitals are buying their reusable gowns because the hospitals can't buy disposable gowns anywhere due to the shortage. I even then talked to a friend who used to work for a lumber company, and she said that she wore PPE to protect from sawdust. And she said that they had reusable gowns and reusable booties, but not reusable masks. My conclusion from this was that FDA approved reusable masks or reusable masks validated by studies don't exist for our use. We're going to revisit this point with some really interesting discussion, but first let's understand the masks that we do have. So at our eye center, we're all familiar with surgical masks. This is a photo taken earlier this week in that hallway in our, um, in our university hallway that connects us to the cafeteria. And it's a recycling bin for disposable masks. Our hospital's preparing just in case we need to reuse disposable masks, which is part of CDC crisis planning. This is a recent study in Nature of the efficacy of surgical face masks. So they included 246 participants and they examined exhaled breaths from these participants. People were randomized to either wear a surgical mask during their exhalation or wear no mask. They were measuring detection of RNA from influenza virus, the uh, common coronavirus and rhinovirus in respiratory droplets and aerosols. They reported that their coronavirus was detected in four of the 10 droplet samples that were collected without masks and none of the samples collected with masks. This study came out April 3rd, 2020, a couple weeks ago earlier this month. Relevant studies like this one are small. They use viruses other than COVID-19 as models and it's hard to know exactly how to apply results to specific scenarios, such as an asymptomatic carrier on our operating table or a symptomatic patient at a slit lamp. The CDC now has a page called Healthcare Professionals Infection Control Using PPE. They recommend that patients with confirmed or possible infection should wear masks and healthcare professionals should use PPE according to their level of risk of exposure. The CDC also gives strategies for optimizing the supply of face masks. They outline three plans for conventional capacity, contingency capacity, and this includes using the same mask for multiple encounters and restricting masks to use by healthcare professionals rather than patients. And they also outline plans for crisis capacity. I think based on what we're doing in our eye center right now, we are following a plan that lies somewhere between conventional and contingency capacities. It's important to recognize, as we've been doing here, that the contingency and crisis strategies assume that we have reduced our patient volume, um, reduced visitors, and reduced non-essential healthcare professionals, and also maximized telemedicine. So let's move on to N95s. This here is my grandmother. She's 93, she's in Queens right now. And she's uh, presenting to us on a telemeeting that happened last weekend, demonstrating her N95s, which she had purchased sometime around 2002 when SARS was in the news. What is an N95? By definition, an N95 mask blocks 95% of 0.3 micron test particles. This here is a meta-analysis that compared surgical masks versus N95s. This meta-analysis included four randomized controlled trials. 
The outcomes that they looked at were laboratory confirmed viral respiratory infections or clinical respiratory illness. They conclude from their meta-analysis that there is no evidence that surgical masks are inferior to N95. If you want more information about reuse of N95s, which we won't uh, delve into today, we'll focus more on surgical masks. Here's one resource from a scientific consortium, including University of Utah faculty, uh, that publishes on N95 decontamination. So early on, we saw many healthcare workers in cloth masks. We've now transitioned our healthcare workers to medical masks at Moran Eye Center, but we do see more and more cloth masks in the community. This is a study that compared N95 versus surgical masks versus homemade cloth masks. They did not use human subjects. They modeled respiration with an apparatus built from syringes. And they looked at detection of RNA from avian flu, which they are using as a COVID-19 model in aerosols. They conclude that N95 blocked almost 100% of the virus, surgical masks blocked 97%, and homemade masks blocked 95%. CDC has now published guidelines for the use of cloth face coverings. They write, CDC is additionally advising the use of simple cloth face coverings to slow the spread. Uh, they recommend fashioning their coverings from household items um, at low cost. They say the cloth face coverings recommended are not surgical masks and not N95 respirators. These are critical supplies that must be continued to be reserved for healthcare workers. They include in their recommendations that uh, cloth face coverings should be worn in the general public, including in places like grocery stores and pharmacies. So I want to spend some time now on innovation, highlighting an idea from the University of Florida and return to our initial question, are reusable masks an option? University of Florida has published on their website that they are making masks for use in their hospital from Halyard at age 600. What is Halyard H600? Well, it's this stuff shown here. It's that blue paper that wraps sterile surgical instruments and trays. The H6, H600 is recommended for heavy instrument trays. Here at Moran Eye Center, we carry H100 through H400. The University of Florida site suggests that they think that these Halyard masks are more effective at droplet protection than a standard surgical mask. As I've discussed this with several people over the past few weeks, people usually stop me here and say, did you say more? Yes, they think that it's more effective. From what I can tell from their site, this is based on the producer's specs. I called a representative from their team to ask what tests they've been running on their masks to validate them. And I haven't received this information from them yet. Community and hospital members in Florida are mass producing these masks for use in their hospital. The masks are autoclaved and cleaned with light for reuse. They're not alternatives to N95. They're not FDA approved. So have we been inspired to try this here at Moran? Well, of course. In fact, we've tested them in an autoclave just yesterday. I recruited Dr. Long to help me sew. Uh, this is showing her beautiful setup in her backyard, including social distancing. This past weekend, we got together and sewed masks according to the University of Florida instructions. All of our materials are shown here. One mask takes less than 10 minutes to make from start to finish. And as of yesterday, the masks survived the autoclave. Challenges in this process so far included materials. Our main operating room probably does have the H600 that is made for heavy instrument trays. There were really long lines at the yarn store. Here I am social distancing. I'm not really savvy at the yarn store yet either. So I did spend 10 minutes standing in a line for cutting fabric before realizing that the cut bar is not a checkout line. Um, but finally with Dr. Long's help, I got the hang of the foot pedal thing. I understand it's good practice for cataract surgery. So we're getting there. 
As Dr. Long talks about practical use in her half of the talk, I want to invite you to consider these questions. Are reusable masks an alternative to disposable masks at Moran? How about for patient wear with the CDC guidelines in mind? Um, and how about after our current protocols are relaxed? Like what about for intravitreal injections? Finally, I wanna give a quick word about 3D printing. This is my significant other. He's an ENT resident in Philadelphia, pictured here modeling their garb. We have at the bottom, the tropical fanny pack inspired by our own Dr. Who. Uh, we have the N95, the swim goggles, which he told me that their trendy chairman purchased for the whole team. And at the top, a 3D printed face shield. People around the country are now 3D printing face shields as well as N95 masks to be fitted with filters. Are we 3D printing here? Of course. This on the left is a photo that I took on March 1st. It's hard to believe, but that was before the campus shut down. I had gotten lost in the undergrad library that day trying to print a poster for one of the many conferences that got canceled. And I had come across this flock of 3D printers and was so impressed, I snapped a photo. Now we're using them to print face shields. Um, you can see the link from University of Utah showing those 3D print face shields on the right. All right, let me turn it over to Dr. Long to talk about university guidelines and practical use at Moran Eye Center. So I'm gonna go over the University of Utah masking policies uh, just to update us all um, and kind of talk about where the rubber beats the road uh, and see if we can have some good discussion about how to keep ourselves safe, how to keep our patients safe as we navigate this pandemic. Um, so all the information I'm gonna go over today is available on the Pulse website. Um, so a lot of this information is here. I'm not gonna go over everything, but if you are interested, there's instructional videos um, and all of the policies online. I also wanted to point out a few more things that as I was uh, reviewing Pulse's website, um, there's actually a recommendation, a list I'll show you next for at home, uh, or well, there's recommendations for at home emergency preparedness, and then also um, recommendations for keeping COVID out of your home uh, for our um, technicians and um, front desk staff, as well as our physicians and residents. And there's also a really nice um, collection of well being resources. There are Zoom group meetings, um, re resources for um, psychiatric uh, consultation um, also available on the website. So I would encourage everyone to check it out uh, and make sure that you're staying up to date. This is uh, something that I thought was also very practical. Uh, I think a lot of my colleagues in medicine um, that I've discussed with over the last few weeks have started implementing a lot of these practices. I think I didn't realize that it was, it came in a list, um, but from talking to one of my friends who's a medicine resident, she says, yes, every night, I go home, I take off my scrubs as I enter my house, I wash my scrubs, I leave my shoes outside, you know, I wipe down my pager, my phone, my keys, my ID badge um, with a wipe uh, before I leave work. And there were some just very practical tips, um, even as far as removing a watch, removing jewelry, bringing your lunch in a disposable bag. Um, and then of course, we're all washing our hands like crazy. So I thought this was helpful and uh, wanted to share with you all. So as of Friday, April 10th, uh, we adopted a universal masking uh, policy at the University of Utah Health. And so I wanted to go over what exactly does that mean for us and what exactly, exactly does that mean for our patients. Um, so in short, um, clinical staff and providers who interact with patients um, and when in public areas of the hospital and clinics must wear a mask. So this means that all of our physicians, all of our technicians, all of our imagers who are directly uh, interacting with patients. Um, even some of our researchers also interact with patients must wear a procedural mask through the day. Uh, I think it's interesting that they have said that they may wear eye protection, um, but they must wear eye protection when caring for a patient with respiratory symptoms. So I know that we have had patients come in, in my experience in the retina clinic who are wearing a mask and do have respiratory symptoms. And I've also noticed many attendings are also wearing eye protection. I think this is something we can talk about given the close proximity um, of our technicians and our uh, ophthalmologists whenever we're doing an exam on a patient. Second, uh, administrators and non-clinical staff who interact with clinical staff 
um, and in, in public areas of the hospitals and clinics. So I think this means all of our staff who works upstairs on the fifth floor, um, you know, I think potentially they could also fall into the third category, but a lot of our physicians come upstairs to their offices. And so one may say that they should wear a procedural mask, um, a standard surgical loop mask, and they should keep this mask and reuse it for multiple days. Uh, last, the administrators and non-clinical staff who work in offices or labs, uh, our current university guidelines recommend that they may wear their own facial covering and they may reuse these for multiple days. Um, Ariana's talked a little bit about this and then I can show you um, some of the other alternatives. I think anyone, um, you know, where I've thought a little bit about where our schedulers and um, administrators, our schedulers fit into this. Um, I think that there are probably schedulers who can remember a time when they have been sneezed on by a patient or coughed on by a patient, even though they're separated from a window. And so certainly I think I would encourage anyone if you want to wear eye protection or you want to upgrade your mask and reuse it, I think that that is a very reasonable thing to do um, based on personal preference. It's always better to be safer than sorry. Teresa, um, can, yes. can you just clarify what you just said to upgrade your surgical mask and oh. um, reuse it? Yes, sorry. So instead of, for example, um, I think that we have for example, um, a lot of our um, staff, administrative staff, uh, Megan, Chandler, Elaine, who work on the fifth floor, um, in some ways have contact with um, the providers as they're coming up to their office. I think it's less likely now, now that those staff are working from home or are, um, you know, and maybe the, the clinic hours are limited. Um, but if a person who's working upstairs, you know, by the university guidelines, they should wear a, a, their, or they can wear a cloth mask, um, their own facial covering that comes from home. But I think it's fine if that individual says, you know, I have contact with clinicians, I would prefer to be a little bit safer and I'll just wear one procedural mask and reuse it. So oh, I think that's something that, that, very helpful. can you say that again? I'm so sorry, just saying thank you for that clarification. That's perfect. You're welcome. So there are guidelines on making your own cloth coverings uh, from a t-shirt. It's actually really easy. Um, you just fold it and then you can use rubber bands. Some benefits to this is that you can rewash the t-shirt. Uh, and so you could even have multiple uh, masks that you can use out in the grocery store and about in the community. Um, I'm not saying that we should use these in clinics, obviously, but I think for people, you know, we still have to go to the grocery store as humans. We still have to go to the pharmacy um, and I think then to then this is a, an alternative for us at home. Um, I I think the other piece that I'd like to talk on is appropriate use of a surgical mask. So I remember being taught as a medical student the sterile technique for the operating room, how to appropriately scrub in, and part of that training was how to um, you know the purpose of a surgical mask. And so the standard ear loop masks that a surgeon wears in the operating room are meant to prevent the surgeon's um, can oral you know, flora from contaminating the surgical wound. And I remember going through a lecture that if you have to sneeze when you're in the operating room and you're holding a retractor, you're supposed to stand straight up, not turn your head from side to side and sneeze. And that way the sneeze goes out the sides of your surgical mask and not into the sterile field. And as I've been wandering around, um, you know, on consults and, or on call and, uh, and around the clinics, I've noticed that there are some inappropriate uses of masks um, that I wanted to point out. So I've seen people wearing it, you know, when you're, you're at Starbucks and you tuck your mask underneath your chin. Um, and uh, I've also seen where um, masks, you know, people will be wearing a mask, but it's not covering their nose which kind of also defeats the purpose. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, we're taught that the outside of the mask is now contaminated. And so when you take off that mask, um, you know, you need to lay it down on a surface on a tissue or a paper towel. Um, the other piece is, you know, when you come out of a room, you should be grabbing it by the ear loops um, and then laying it and then performing hand hygiene before and after. And so I just wanted to point out these. Um, I thought they were helpful. They were on the university website as well just to make sure that we're getting the most out of our masks.
And uh, last, Ariana has already talked about this, um, reprocessing bins. I'm not sure if we have one at the Moran. I know there is one in the walkway um, between the Moran and the University Hospital. Uh, I know that some residents are saving our masks and paper bags in the call room and in, if in the event we were to need to reuse them and figure out a way to re-sterilize them. So then that's all about us and who should be wearing a mask, but what about the patients that we're seeing? Um, so current university policy as of 4-9 um, says that patients with respiratory complaints should be provided with a mask. So I think right now we're doing an excellent job. Everyone is being screened when they're coming into the Moran. If they're having respiratory symptoms, I, they are, I believe they are being provided with a mask. Visitors with respiratory complaints should be denied entry. I think here, even at the Moran, we've gone a little bit further and we're not allowing visitors upstairs. Um, patients and um, Visitors without respiratory complaints may wear their own facial coverings, um, but can also enter without a mask. Now, I think this is a very debatable um, question, and I want to um, also talk about, before we get into this, what about the really sick patients we are seeing? So should, you know, what kind of gear do we need to wear to take these, you know, see these patients? I don't think this is necessarily applicable to all of our patients in clinic. I know we have a room down on the first floor that's designed for seeing COVID positive patients. Um, but I do think that this is incredibly relevant for the consult residents and the residents taking call. And I think it's definitely something we have to consider. Um, so this for patients who are confirmed having, of having COVID um, or suspected of having COVID, meaning they may be admitted to the hospital for some other issue and they're known as a COVID rule out while we're waiting for that test to come back. Um, to see those patients, if you are doing a non-aerosolizing procedure, um, the standard precautions would be droplet, contact, and eye protection. So this means that you're wearing an ear loop mask, you're wearing eye protection, and gowns and gloves. Something that they've added on the floors, which I heard from my uh, medicine colleagues, uh, was actually an observer for doffing PPE. Um, so in particular, um, with, other, with other things, it can be challenging the most common time that a provider is going to be contaminated is when you're doffing your PPE. And so um, there is actually a nurse who is designed to help everyone get out of their PPE on these, sh on these floors and on these shifts. And I think utilizing that person um, is an outstanding resource. And then if you have um, aerosolizing generating procedure, so these would be intubation, extubation, um, non-invasive um, ventilation and then anything with open suction or are you thinking about a patient getting a breathing treatment or who's in the ICU on high flow. In this case, you, the provider and, and the staff taking care of the patient needs to be in either a PAPR, a CAPR or an N95 mask with eye protection, gown and gloves. Um, and so, and they also have observers um, for doffing. So this is, uh, Two or three weeks ago when I was on call on Saturday, I got a consult of about a 71 year old patient. She was found to have conjunctivitis, fever and skin rash, and also a rash including her oral mucosa. And she was transferred from an outside hospital due to concerns for Steven Johnson syndrome. Uh, her preliminary biopsy results had returned and were strongly suspicious for Steven Johnson's um, per dermatology. And she was a quote, COVID rule out. And so the staff, you know, the nurse practitioner, when she consulted me, she's like, well, we really don't think that she has COVID. We think that her fever and her conjunctivitis are probably from her Stevens Johnson syndrome. Um, but she, the test at the outside hospital had started the process of getting the test and it takes them like six days to get their COVID testing back at that time. So they re-swabbed her here and we're waiting on the results. So we didn't know. So I went up to the fifth floor and I, you know, this is a patient that needs to be seen. There's concern for Stevens Johnson's. You know, we're obviously concerned about the ocular surface. Um, and I went up to the floor and they said, hey, all the providers up here are wearing pappers. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, well, okay. So uh, I had a very lovely uh, nurse named uh, Lindsay who helped me get in and out of a papper. And so I, talked um, about this with the chief on at the time and I said, you know, um, I actually don't fit an N95 mask with my face structure. I'm supposed to wear a papper. So even if we had one available um, uh, in the room, you know, uh, it wouldn't have fit me. 
And one could say, well, was I not doing an aerosolizing procedure? Uh, should I have just worn a standard surgical mask and done a dilated exam? So I decided with the help of my chief um, to just perform a surface exam and defer dilated testing given her good visual acuity until it could be done after her test returned negative, which it later did. Um, so her exam, uh, without giving you all the measurements, she essentially had moderate involvement of the palpebral conjunctiva um, bilaterally, and she did go on to get amniotic membrane transplants. Um, so I think that this presents us with some challenges that are unique to ophthalmology. Um, you know, we all see the guidelines that are um, for aerosolizing procedures. And I think in ophthalmology, especially, we're in close proximity to the patient, uh, especially during direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy. So I know the neuro-ophthalmologists, I don't believe, are doing direct ophthalmoscopy anymore. Um, but even, you know, our slit lamps now have shields. Um, but we can all remember doing an exam, a 20 diopter indirect exam on a patient and having them fog up the back of our lens with their breath. Um, and we also have um, a lot of, I'm going to say, maybe non-sterilizable isn't the, the best term, but um, difficult to clean equipment. So for the consult resident or even in the room, we have near cards, tono pins, we reuse bottles of eye drops. Um, we have a pinhole occluder, muscle light, um, all of the slit lamp knobs, even if you're wearing gloves and you touch the patient's eyelid and then you touch the slit lamp knob. Um, and then also the surfaces of our lenses. And I think all of us as consult residents have experienced this in some way or another. We go to the children's hospital, we see a kid that has flu. We wipe down everything with the purple wipes. Um, and then our, we're a jovial bunch, uh, as pointed out in Dr. Who's most recent Staff Pearls article um, about updates of ocular, um, ocular findings in COVID. Um, and we are often coughing, or we're often talking to the patient during the exam. Um, and we've asked the patients not to talk and things like that. So not only in clinic, but our residents on call and consults are the first line, I think, of, of defense. And we're right there on the front, first line and the front line. And so I also wanted to point out a lovely, um, a lovely I, was, I was called a fomite with legs a few weeks ago by Dr. Hoffman, which I told him was the nicest compliment I'd ever been given. Um, but I think it's true. We're everywhere on call. We're everywhere on consults. Um, and so we really have to be um, cognizant about what, what we're doing. So I would encourage the providers who um, are in the clinical realm now to really think about our consult resident and our, our residents on call because it's maybe has been a while since you've done an exam in the ICU leaning over a bed on an intubated patient trying to just like squeak your 28 into the field of view when they don't dilate so well or on the floor is thinking about a patient who's COVID positive and on high flow uh, nasal cannula and uh, discerning how to discern patients that need to be seen after hours at Moran or if they have respiratory symptoms, should we be sending them through the ER? And uh, also the inability to wear it indirect for a dilated fundus exam over a PAPR or a CAPR for those residents who maybe don't, um, in my case, aren't supposed to wear it or aren't fit tested for an N95. Um, a few words about PAPRs, um, so powered air purifying respirators. So, you know, the N95, as Ariana has discussed with you, filters out 95% of the particles. The PAPRs are like 99.7, um, so they are safer. Um, PAPR training is available through Work Wellness. I wanted to give a shout out to our chiefs who I believe have all gone and got PAPR trained. Um, and there are now people that can be like super trainers and come back and train other people on how to use PAPRs. I don't know if this is something that we necessarily need at Moran at this time, but I do think that um, as a resident on the floors, it's something that I want to be well versed in. Um, fit testing for N95 masks is also available through Work Wellness. Um, they have one, my understanding is they have one N95 mask at this time. Some of the chiefs may be able to comment at the University of Utah. Um, and so if you fail that N95 mask, then you are um, to wear a PAPR. They do recommend that it's updated annually. Um, and there, I provided the number for work wellness and the hours, you just give them a call. They are a few days out for fit testing because there's a high demand for patient, for nursing and other staff that's there. Um, you know, and whether or not, you know, who we should maybe prioritize as far as who's most likely to see patients, I think is something that we can also discuss. Um, there are also videos online on um, 
pulse that show appropriate donning and doffing techniques if you even just wanted to brush up and didn't want to go buy work wellness in person and get a tutorial from an occupational med physician. Uh, last, these are not related to masks, but I wanted to um, talk about a few things in the community. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen the white ribbons. Um, someone came around from clinic the other day and was giving out white ribbons and in support of healthcare workers. I think this is uh, really great. I know our techs at Moran wear black, but the nurses in the hospital wear white, um, physicians with a white coat and all of the, all of the staff together um, who is continuing to work through the pandemic. Um, you can use the hashtag Utah Cares and uh, it will come up in whatever your social media outlet is. And last, um, there's a, 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 this is not an extensive list of benefits from, local, from businesses. Um, so there's free childcare available through the U. Um, Starbucks is offering free tall coffees on Wednesdays through May 3rd for all healthcare, for healthcare providers. Um, Jiffy Lube is 25 off your next oil change. Krispy Kreme donuts, uh, five dozen free donuts on Mondays. It is first come first serve um, through Monday, May 11th. And then Uber Eats has promised lots of free meals to healthcare providers. Um, Headspace, so all healthcare professionals have access to Headspace through 2020. It's a great uh, mindfulness and meditation app. I've used it personally um, at, as, with some of the residents. And then Pit Viper um, is actually a local sunglasses um, company um, and they have discount codes for um, eyewear protection. And so I wanted to point out that a few weeks ago when I was on call, these are the emergency medicine residents sporting their pits, um, pit bikes. And uh, I was ever so thrilled. I told them I had to take a picture because I was so excited that they were protecting their eyes. And uh, I will say, if you do go to the Pit Vipers website, some content may not be appropriate for young users. <laughs> so, all right. So I think we've had a lot of discussion questions. Ariana and I have brainstormed a, uh, a, quite a few. And I have seen the feed going off, but haven't looked at any of the questions. Um, I think we'll, I can uh, let Dr. Petty take over and we'll moderate and, and we'll go from there. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Ariana and Teresa. Extraordinary, uh, extraordinary presentation. Uh, uh, learned a lot personally. A uh, few questions. Uh, Brad Katz, I'm going to have you queue up your question here in a moment, uh, or at least your comment, and then Craig Chai as well after Brad, uh, just your comment about the uh, iPhone indirects. Um, and one thing, just uh, while they get their, their uh, computers off mute, so many of you have seen these. These are full face uh, scuba masks. The Center for Medical Innovation here at the University of Utah recently developed PAPRs based off of these designs. Uh, they've been tested by occupational medicine, which uh, ended up certifying them actually as better than many commercially available PAPRs. They just sent 125 down to the Navajo Nation, whereas we know there's a significant outbreak there uh, and PPE is uh, in short supply. So a lot of innovations. Uh, if I can find a link, I'll send that. And then at the end of Grand Rounds, I'll also post a link. Uh, there's a, a project Protect uh, you is an organization that uh, will send you supplies. You can sew your own mask, and then those masks can be sent to them for sterilization and be put into use both at IHC and at the University of Utah Hospital. So look for that link at the end. Brad, why don't you go ahead and uh, make your comment on reusable masks? Hey, Ariana and Teresa, I think that's awesome that you took the initiative to look up the information that they're using in Florida to use the halyard material. Um, I just, I'm a little bit uncomfortable having a mask that is just autoclaved and reusing it because like the mask, it's like mucus and stuff on it. Can those masks be washed and then uh, sterilized? I think that's a great point. Is autoclave enough or do we need them to be washed? I think about our green gowns because I think that you're right that reusable gowns do get washed and it's not just autoclave and those certainly maybe less so in our ORs, but in main OR must have a lot of bodily fluids on them. Uh, so I do not think that Florida is washing their masks. I think that they're only using autoclave and light. And I'm not sure that the material is supposed to get wet, um, but if we were to consider reusable 
fabrics and materials, I think that's a really important point because you're right, there may be chunks of something um, inside the masks. I wonder if the green material that's used to make the reusable gowns could be used to make a mask. Yeah, I wondered the same thing. I think that it seems a bit heavy, but uh, I, I haven't really tried it. And you know, that halyard material, uh, I think it can get steam sterilized. So maybe it's hardier than we think. Uh, Craig Chaya. I just made a comment about using smartphone technology, but I would defer to Eileen. She's kind of our resident expert on smartphone ophthalmoscopy. Yeah, I, Dr. Chai, I think that's a, a great point, and Eileen as well. Um, I've been watching the chat, and I think there's a lot of interest in learning to use smartphones to get the dilated exams that we're otherwise unable to get in our gear. Uh, I think it's kind of hard. Um, I am pretty good at it, but uh, I don't think it's something that can be learned with the online tutorial. I think it's in person. Uh, and me adjusting you, uh, but I'm happy to do that with anyone, <laughs> so. Thank you, Eileen. And to be clear, Eileen is not a resident, but she is our resident expert uh, on indirect uh, ophthalmoscopy. Uh, one of the questions that came through, uh, if, if uh, either of the speakers have any experience with this, uh, was around furnace filters that you can get an N90 furnace filter. People have been using that to uh, add a filter layer to homemade masks. Uh, do either of you uh, have any knowledge of whether or not that's worthwhile? So I would say, first of all, with the, I think several questions about how well do those filters, I know people are using, um, people commented vacuum, I know other people are using coffee filters, how well do these work? I think looking at the studies that we talked about today, we don't really have a good idea about how any of what we're using, including surgical masks, are working. Um, like I said earlier, the studies have relatively small numbers and they typically use other viruses as a model for COVID-19. So I don't think we have a good answer to those. That being said, the 3D printed N95s that I've seen uh, do have a spot to insert in a 95 filter, and that's the filtering part with a plastic uh, structure that fits to the face. So for anyone that is uh, calling in, just a couple of other comments that have come in, a question whether or not you need to dilate for uh, smartphone indirect ophthalmoscopy, the answer is yes, uh, you do. And we'll allow our speakers, then it looks like the questions are, are wrapping up. Uh, and, and I'm so sorry, it looks like Eileen did uh, note that Nepalese eye providers could do it non-dilated, but I can't because I'm not as skilled. Uh, so we, what we will do is we'll go ahead and wrap up with final comments from Dr. Levin, from Dr. Long, uh, and then I am posting that link to uh, Project Protect. Again, this is a collaboration between University of Utah, IHC, and LDS Charities where you can, uh, they'll send you materials and you can sew masks that then can be used in the healthcare environment. Uh, we'll go ahead, uh, Dr. Levin, and then Dr. Long. I want to thank everybody for their interest today and the comments. Um, you are welcome to come talk to us more if you want to see the masks that we sewed just as prototypes or if you have more ideas for what we can be doing here. Thanks everyone.